The Life of Paracelsus by Thomas Fuller, 1608-1661, from his book The Holy State. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Paracelsus Philip Theastrophus Bombastus of Hohenheim, or Paracelsus, born, as he saith himself, in the wilderness of Helvetia, anno 1493, of the noble and ancient family of the Hohenheims. But Thomas Erastus, making strict inquiry after his pedigree, found none of his name or kindred in that place. Yet it is fit so great a chemist should make himself to be of noble extraction and let us believe him to be of highest descent or perchance born on some mountain in switzerland as for his education he himself boasts that he lived in most universities of europe surely rather as a traveller than a student and a vagabond than a traveller yea some will not allow him so much and one who hath exactly measured the length of his life though crowding his pretended travels very close finds not room enough for them but tis too ridiculous what a scholar of his relates that he lived ten years in arabia to get learning and conversed in greece with the athenian philosophers whereas in that age arabia the happy was accursed with barbarism and athens grown a stranger to herself both which places being then subjected to the turks the very ruins of all learning were ruined there thus we see how he better knew to act his part than to lay his scene and had not chronology enough to tell the clock of time when and where to place his lies to make them truth the first five and twenty years of his age he lived very civilly being thirty years old he came to basel just at the alteration of religion when many papists were expelled the university and places rather wanted professors than professors places here by the favor of oe Calampadius, he was admitted to read physic and for two years behaved himself fairly till his accident caused his departure a rich canon of basil being sick promised paracelsus an hundred florins to recover him which being restored to his health he denied to pay paracelsus sues him is cast in his suit and the magistrate adjudging him only an ordinary fee because a cure was done perfectly with a few pills the physician enraged hereat talked treason against the state in all his discourses till the nimbleness of his tongue forced the nimbleness of his feet and he was fain to fly into alsatia here keeping company with the gentry of the country he gave himself over to all licentiousness his body was the sea wherein the tide of drunkenness was ever ebbing and flowing for by putting his finger in his throat he used to spew out his drink and drunkenness together and from that instant dade himself sober to return to his cups again every month he had a new suit not for pride but necessity his apparel serving both for wearing and bedding and having given his clothes many vomits he gave them to the poor being coderous overnight he would be crocious in the morning flush of money as he carried the invisible indies in his pocket some suspected the devil was his purse-bearer and that he carried a spirit in the pommel of his sword his constant companion whilst others maintained that by the heat of the furnace he could ripen any metal into gold all the diet he prescribed his patients was this to eat what and how often they thought fitting themselves and yet he did most strange cures like the quicksilver he so much dealt with he would never be fixed in one place or live anywhere longer than a twelve month for some observed that by that time the maladies reverted again which he formerly cured he gave so strong physic as summoned nature with all her force to expel the present disease but the remnant dregs thereof, afterwards reinforcing themselves, did assault nature tired out with the violence of her former task, and easily subdued it. His scholars bragged that the fragments of his learning would feast all the philosophers in the world, boasting that the gout, the disgrace of physic, was the honor of Paracelsus, 
who by curing it removed that scandal from his profession, whereas others say he had little learning and less Latin. When any asked him the name of an herb he knew not, he would tell them there was no use thereof in physic, and yet this man would undertake not only to cure men, but to cure the art of curing men, and reform physic itself. As for his religion, it would as well pose himself as others to tell what it was. He boasted that shortly he would order Luther and the Pope, as well as he had done Galen and Hippocrates. He was never seen to pray and seldom came to church. He was not only skilled in natural magic, the utmost bounds were of border on the suburbs of hell, but his charge to converse constantly with familiars. Guilty he was of all vices but wantonness, and I find an honest man his compurgator, that he was not given to women. Perchance he drank himself into wantonness and passed it, quenching the fire of his lust by piling fuel too hard and fast upon it. Boasting that he could make a man immortal, he himself died at forty-seven years in the city of Salzburg. His scholars say he was poisoned through the envy, that dark shadow of ever waiting on the shining merit, and malice of his adversaries. However, his body should have been so fenced with antidotes that the battery of no poison might make a breach therein except we impute it more to his neglect than want of skill and that rather his own security than his enemy's malice brought him to his grave but it may be he was willing to die counting a twelve-month time enough to stay in one place and forty-seven years long enough to live in one world we may more admire that so beastly a drunkard lived so long than that so skilful a man died so soon in a word, he boasted of more than he could do, did more cures seemingly than really, more cures really than lawfully, of more parts than learning, of more fame than parts, a better physician than a man, a better cirurgian than a physician. End of The Life of Paracelsus by Thomas Fuller